Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 98th Fireside Chat. All right. So we're currently in the process of uh, putting Dr. Sandra up front. Oh, there we go. Uh, Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you? <laughs> Good. I think this is actually my first time meeting you um, virtually. Uh, I think and, so. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know Jason did a Fiery Embers with you and he did your interview. Uh, mm -hmm. It was actually just really funny. Like, uh, Jason is handling the uh, the setup of like the live and everything right now. And I was mm -hmm. like, Dr. Sanders in the back room, but I can't let her in. You have to do it. I'm like texting. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> I was just telling people I'm at like a coffee shop and everything right now. So, um, yeah. uh, just fireside chat shenanigans, but, uh, just want to let everybody know that we are live on all the platforms and excited to have you, Dr. Sandra on the show. And this is our 98th episode. So we're like two off from our 100th episode here. That's amazing. You guys are doing fantastic and it's such a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you having you on the show and leading up to it, I was rereading re your story again and it's just really cool story and I've got so many questions. Uh, most of this is just going to flow like a fun conversation like the fiery embers and mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's just a lot of cool things to talk about that we can't really encompass in one live so we're just going to have some fun. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Uh, so one of the things I like to do is I think that people in general are very bad at giving themselves hype up intros um, because we're all pretty humble at what we do and it's just it's really hard to do it so I've got a bit of a hype up intro for you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so no normally it would be like a ta-da I like bring you in from the back room and everything but Jason mm -hmm. had to do it this time so you just have to sit there awkwardly while I do this. <laughs> Oh, no, it's totally fine. This is great. <laughs> so uh, some of the stuff that I've read about you is that you were a five time NCAA all American swimmer. You've been you've been swimming since you were three years old uh, during the and during the course of your collegiate career, you navigated this whole journey of swimming, not just your collegiate career, but like from the age of three to middle school through college of like finding joy in swimming, doing it because of like safety, parental decisions, uh, navigating burnouts and injury. And this eventually led you to this identity of the swimmer doc, where you want to pass on the teachings that you gained from your experiences to help others. Uh, and so that's kind of the gist of what we're going to talk about today, folks. Uh, and so I think I'm going to jump right into saying Welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Harrell. Thank you. So, so nice to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So one of the things uh, I do want to ask you is, I don't know if Jason ever asked you the icebreaker question because it's like a fiery embers. We ask it on all of our normal fireside chats. I don't know if we do it on the fiery embers, but this will decide if I had to drag Jason back here and to do the interview or... Uh, or I do your interview. So are you ready for the icebreaker question? Sure, yeah. Uh, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Ah. Mm, that's funny. My hesitation would already probably tell you, give you a hint. Um, as an adult, nay. As a child, yay. Are you, are, you, <laughs> are you originally from the East Coast? No, no, I am from West Coast. Oh my God, I don't buy it. That's <laughs> so <Well>, wild. I... <laughs> Every single. Why do East Coast people like pineapple on their pizza? At least every single person I've talked to on the chat, it's like, do you like pineapple on your pizza? Every time they say nay, they're like, yeah, but I'm from Delaware. I'm from New York City. And then the West Coast people are always like, or the pineapple on pizza people are like, I'm from Hawaii. I'm from California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. No, I, I used to like it a lot more. Um, now I kind of like my savory and my sweet one kind of separate. So. <laughs> Definitely. So 
I, uh, one of the things I really wanted to dive into was just talking about like, uh, so you've written, so you've done an interview with Jason and there's a story on the platform about you, uh, which I'll share the link to that again. It's a really cool story. I want to dive into like starting at the age of three, like you had this like fear of water and you jumped into the pool when you were three. And I just want to kind of like start there and like talk a bit about like your swimming journey. Sure, absolutely. So at three, it was mainly, you know, parents forcing me into the sport, less of a sport, more for water safety, life saving skills. Um, was never a fan of swimming at that age, but uh, I got into it because, you know, my brother who's six years older than me, you know, was underwater. And so, you know, I always wanted to be like my older brother, do whatever he did, you know. Um, and so that's kind of what got me started. He was underwater. So I just went head first in to see, you know, what was going on. Um, I don't know if I choked on water. I don't know if I knew to hold my breath at that point. I was just told that, like, you know, I just went head first after um, my parents, like I was at the YMCA trying to learn and it was an indoor pool. So a lot of echo. Uh, so apparently all the lifeguards knew me cause I was that one kid that would scream her head off <laughs> at knee deep water right by the stairs with the rail, you know? Um, so that was, that was me. That was that kid <laughs> growing up with swimming. Um, so that's kind of my first exposure to being in the water. And then from there, um, I, it was more, you know, my mom wanting me to be a part of it because my brother was also on the swim team. So, you know, I naturally like, well, you know, I kind of like it, I guess, you know, I like it because he's doing it. <laughs> so I just want to do whatever he's doing. Um, and so I joined a competitive swim team at the age of five and was competitive um, through my you know, childhood years. Um, and, and then, you know, I think halfway through, you know, I think elementary school, I just was, I, I wasn't really into it. I was more so I just want to hang out with my brother. But, you know, at such a big age gap, we were just swimming at different levels. It just wasn't fun for me to be swimming laps and doing like, so I actually really hated swimming um, during during my early years, um, and eventually, you know, I convinced my mom to quit for a couple of years, and then came like junior high, middle school. You know, everybody's just trying to find their identity, find what they're good at. You know, um, and so I hopped right back into swimming because that was really the one sport that. I knew, or at least I was familiar with, you know, I didn't have to, you know, learn a new skill or a new sport, new rules. I already kind of knew it off the, you know, off like the back of my head. And so I went back into swimming and this time I fell in love with it because it was more of the competitive nature in me, you know, that, you know, I wanted to excel in something and that kind of became my outlet for, you know, competition, you know, and um, just wanting to be good at something and it came very natural at that point. So tell me a bit, so now that you've talked about competition and kind of that being the driving force behind you getting back into swimming after navigating burnout for the first time, talk mm -hmm. a bit, uh, dive into uh, your collegiate career and oh. Uh, talk a bit about that. One of the things that stood out to me was like factors of guidance, uh, the level of competition, and also um, just like navigating injury. Yeah. So going into uh, my freshman year in college, I was already experiencing injury from, you know, improper recovery strategies, just overtraining. Um, mentally, I didn't, I didn't feel the burnout, but physically, uh, my body was starting to alert me that, you know, Hey, I'm starting to get pain here and there, you know, in my back and in my shoulder. Um, but you know, just, you know, swimming back then was just very different. I think sports in general back then 
were just very different. There's a lot less guidance in like the rehab and recovery, you know, sectors of the sport than there is in terms of performance. So performance, there's always a lot of you know, resources in terms of coaching, but very little coaching and guidance when it came to rehab, injury prevention, proper recovery, um, making sure you're not overtraining. Uh, so yes, so going back, going into college, I was already dealing with some sort of like upper back shoulder issue. Um, and I was training, you know, I came from a smaller club team. However, I did train club and high school in order to hit my volume to try to be competitive when I entered college. So to compensate for a, being part of a smaller club team, I would double my work every day um, and maybe even swim like three times a day just to try to, you know, like be competitive and not <laughs> not not be too much of a rookie my freshman year. Um, so so because of that, because of the overtraining you know, and improper training, um, that's what kind of led to my injuries. And so going into college, it was it was very eye opening because it was the first time I was a part of a very large and competitive team. Um, and so I was just not used to the volume, you know, of training all of a sudden and at the intensity that I was expected to train at. Um, so that further, you know, propagated my injuries and made them worse. And it, you know, it was also the first, my first exposure, first real exposure to strength and conditioning too. Um, prior to college, all of my training really was in the pool. You know, we did do some dry land exercises, but they were all body weight, you know, maybe an occasional med ball or slam ball, you know, for equipment. Um, but we lacked strength training. Um, and now to, you know, 10 years forward, I'm recognizing that, you know, there were, you know, that was probably the stuff issue it was the lack of proper supplemental training you know and um that's that's kind of where i am here in terms of like injury prevention and my view and my lens of swimming it's that you know the injury prevention realm of things uh so but yeah going into college and that was the first time i had any proper strength and conditioning um so it was great, you know, my body finally felt like it was training properly. However, at the same time, I was already dealing with a chronic injury. Um, so it was almost like it was a little too late to try to bandage things up. Um, and so, you know, just navigating that in college was a little tough because in college, it, you it was still the mentality of no pain, no gain. You know, I think there still is some of that mentality today, but I think in terms of coaching and training cycles and structures, we're smarter, you know, <laughs> we don't, we're not hard headed um, to only have that mentality. Now we're, you know, more interested in, you know, and curious and like, okay, well, what can we change to, what can we modify to accommodate injury or prevent injury from happening? Um, so yeah, that's kind of, um, that's kind of where you know, college swimming was great. However, you know, the strength training aspect, if I had it sooner, I probably wouldn't have been injured, but because I was already injured, I wasn't getting the strength training that would have helped me specifically to accommodate my injuries so yeah so I, I, that's i'm really glad that you brought up like the way training was be done and you got into the specifics of like what existed back then what didn't because that was definitely one of my questions of like how the sport has changed over the years and how coaching has changed over the years and so one thing i do want to ask you is uh like this sort this eventually led you down the path of like becoming the uh, the swimmer doc uh, and becoming a coach and uh, I wanted to ask you was that like more of a gradual process of like figuring out that's what you wanted to do or was it was there kind of a epiphany that you had or several epiphanies that you had that 
you wanted to take this knowledge that you've built from your experience and you wanted to help others? Yeah, it was more of a gradual process, definitely more of you know, having multiple epiphanies. It wasn't even just one epiphany. Um, I went into physical therapy and rehab because it was more of like a personal thing. You know, I was just, I had dealt with so many injuries in college and in high school that, you know, I just felt like if I wanted to remain active and athletic, which, you know, I've just always been active, you know, that, so that was kind of, a no brainer, you know, so if I wanted to continue to stay active and be athletic and surf and run and lift and do all these fun things, then I better learn how to take care of myself, you know, rather than fall back on, you know, a healthcare system with, you know, very little guidance and direction from my providers. Um, and so it was more of like the autonomy that I was seeking and, you know, the need to like treat myself and make sure like, hey, I'm at the very least, you know, my first and foremost goal was to like rehab myself so that I can continue doing the things I love and not have to worry about messing and dealing with pain for the rest of my life just so that I can, you know, stay active. Um, so it was more of like, you know, a selfish reason for me wanting to go into physical therapy. Um, going into school, you know, being from such an athletic background, I wanted to, it was very natural for me to want to go into sports medicine and sports rehabilitation. Um, just because, you know, I was like, well, I'm going into this because, you know, I want to help people like me. But, you know, down the line, it was just in terms of the structure and the different settings of being in a sports and ortho background, I recognized that, hey, I'm not if I worked in a clinic, um, it wasn't necessary that I would work with athletes all the time. You know, um, it's just, you know, a lot, oftentimes these clinics will say like, oh, it's a sports clinic, but they see a lot more, you know, orthopedics, just regular orthopedics. Um, they see geriatrics, they see just workers comp. And there's nothing wrong with any of that, but it made me realize that like, it, you know, it wasn't as transparent as what they said it would be. So I wanted something different. Um, so I ended up going through into like the hospital system and working um, in like a skilled nursing facility instead and helping and working with the geriatric population a lot for some time. Um, and then over, over the years, I just, I lost, I felt like I was losing a big part of myself with like each month and year that passed working in, you know, a hospital setting or an acute, you know, acute care setting. Um, and, you know, I just, I was feeling the burnout in terms of my career and I was losing interest in wanting to be active and just, you know, just being happy. I just, it, the, my career was taking a lot out of me uh, mentally and emotionally. Um, and so I thought, you know, I, I needed to switch up the pace and do something different because, you know, I went into this profession because I wanted to help people um, along with like myself, but I wanted to like share my knowledge, you know, and I had such, I have such a dense background in athletics that I, I wanted to put it to use somewhere. So I took some time away from being in the traditional healthcare setting. Um, and then I kind of, you know, was starting to get back in the water from time to time. I would hop back in the pool and just swim. I'd swam with, you know, several masters teams and I really liked it, you know, but um, it just still wasn't I, nothing was clicking for me yet. And then one day, you know, I was just kind of brainstorming with my husband and we were just talking about like, how about I mesh the things I'm very passionate about into one thing? Like, how can I mesh everything I enjoy into one thing, you know? And that was me realizing that like, hey, I still am very passionate about swimming, you know? Um, competitively, I love the sport. I love the skill development, you know, just how intricate it is. Um, and there's just so much 
about singing and you know i think just the in terms of like kinesiology you know just understanding like how the body works and body movement and how it's like a small a small thing in your body can affect something very large and i feel like with swimming it's very apparent with that in terms of like fixing you know technique and fine-tuning aspects of your technique will greatly impact your overall speed you know and so i you know have a very strong background in like getting into the nitty gritty of like technique and so combining that and you know, combining injury prevention and rehab and strength training just it kind of became my practice you know it kind of became like my career and my profession where you know i'm molding all these pieces together and yeah it's they're all kind of interconnected you know with injuries it's usually not just one thing injuries are very injury and you know pain is you know multifactorial and so if you know i've treated so many athletes down the line that you know they come to me especially swimmers you know they come to me and they're like you know i have shoulder pain and i'm like okay well that tells me very little you know it, there are multiple reasons why you have shoulder pain you know it can be something that's insidious that is you know originating from your technique or it could be you know like something more traumatic where you had something like hit you or you ran into something you know and so it was just i started to you know play detective and kind of figure out and piece out you know injuries for this particular group you know for like a, for aquatic athletes and you know i started to realize that hey you know technique is just as important as strength training you know and that was something that i think most people still don't really realize in the swimming world you know people think that you know in order to be a fast swimmer let alone injury prevention so we're not even touching base on like the injury just on the performance side not on not even rehab but performance side people think you know it's proper programming in the pool in terms of volume intensities, you know, volume and intensities and specificity in your training. And I agree with all of that, you know, it's really important. However, you know, strength training also plays a part in not only supplementing pool training or open water training, you know, but also, you know, uh, injury prevention you know and then so i started to dive into that and then realizing that like hey you can have a stellar and stellar strength program and swim program and a swim coach right and you can do all that correctly but you can still get injured you know you can have proper programming recovery into it however you can still get injured so i'm like so what i am trying to figure out now or what i have realized is that there are multiple pieces to injury prevention and to performance. You know, you've got to have the proper technique. You have you have to have proper programming, and proper swim coaching. You know, and you also have to have proper strength programming. You know, and proper strength, but that also includes prehab. So things with like mobility. You know, things in terms of um, Prehab, it would be like mobility, strength, you know, as well as things that would affect your recovery, like nutrition and hydration and sleep would also affect your performance. So it's, I've, my practice has now become very holistic and I, you know, instead of just looking at the injury itself and just trying to, you know, fix a shoulder pain, now I'm looking at their lifestyle. I'm looking at their training cycles and training periodization. I'm looking at their technique to find the root of the problem. Um, and I'm also, you know, addressing, you know, things that are outside of their sport, you know, like hydration and nutrition and whatnot. And that those, all those factors play, you know, a role into pain and pain perception as well as injury and injury development and recovery, so. That makes sense. Uh, and there are a lot of things that I wanna dive into there, but specifically, uh, specifically strength training because jason and i are both ultra runners we're big proponents of strength training for injury prevention and 
I just think that it is a concept among endurance athletes and athletes that is a universal concept. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do think that uh, it needs to be emphasized more. So talk a little bit more about the importance of strength training and how that made a difference for you and how that's made a difference for your clients. Absolutely. So, well, with strength training, you know, I say that is a, it's a supplement you know, to pull training, but that is me not even giving it proper credit because I think to become, to become not only a good athlete, but also an athlete with longevity in their career, you need strength training. It's equally as important. Um, sometimes depending on the type of athlete you are, if you are say like a sprinter versus an endurance athlete, you know, strength training may actually play an even bigger role than pool training, you know, um, or swim specific training. Um, so yeah, I think with, and it's also, it's so important, you know, to not have you know, cookie cutter programs, you know, um, I know a lot of people who will, who don't have proper strength training, they do it, you know, which is great. It's always a good start. And it, you know, it always surprises me, but pleases me at the same time that like, Hey, you know, when I ask them, are you, are you working out in the gym? And they're like, yeah, you know, I am. And I'm like, okay, well, do you have, are you, are you swimming? because you have competitive goals, like you want to race in the Ironman or you want to do an Ironman or are you trying to do like a 4K in open water, you know, or are you like a competitive pole swimmer and looking to, you know, to go to the Olympics th this year, you know? Um, and whenever they say, yeah, like I am, I have these large competitive goals, um, but I just do my own strength training. And, you know, how can you expect how can you expect to be competitive at such a high level without like a proper swim coach, you know, right. Without proper swim programming and the same would go for strength. Training, right. You know, like how can you expect to be, to be able to do that on your own when you don't have the proper coaching behind that, you know? And I think, I think that is usually, you know, like the first conversation that I, have. you know, like, are you happy with your strength? programming and do are you finding results seeing results and if you're not seeing results and you don't have proper strength training well now there's a gap in your training that we can fill you know um and so going through there you know just making sure you have prop, the proper strength coach for the sport too being sport specific does help you know i would rather have you know, my athletes train, or I would rather train with a strength coach who has a swimming background, who understands the intricacies of the sport, the different techniques, the different phases of a stroke, and how to manipulate walls, you know, and turns and finishes and starts and all that, you know, knowing when to be explosive and when to, you know, when to maybe kick in the endurance in terms of strength programming and coaching. Um, so, you know, it always helps to have like, you know, a strength coach who knows the sport through and through, as opposed to a strength coach that, you know, does everything. You can't be a jack of, you know, if you're going to be a jack of all trades, you're going to be a master of none. Right. Um, so that's kind of what I would tell my athletes. Like, Hey, that's great that you have a strength coach now do you have goals of swimming collegiately or do you have goals of competing in an Ironman? You know, um, because if you do, I hope your strength coach knows how to program you for the, for your sport and not even your sport before your specific event too, you know? So that's, that's kind of the gist of strength training. Did I answer all of your questions? Are there more about strength training? Uh, actually, I think it feeds into my next question, which, you know, you were talking about like the right type of programming, which makes a lot of sense because even in running a lot of the, there's a lot of stuff you could do versus like, you should be doing a lot of unilateral stuff. Um, and it's just like, there's so much specificity involved. So it kind of feeds into the topic of like specificity and intentionality and um, I think this is another universal thing in sports too, where people think that 
you have to do a lot of volume, just like mm-hmm. stuff a lot of volume to just become like insanely competitive. And maybe in the case of running, it's like you have to just run fast all the time, I think is a common misconception, one that I fell prey to. Um, and so one of the things that I've seen you emphasize a lot is like specificity in training and intentionality and in everything that you do. So talk about the importance of specificity, not only in swimming uh, and intentionality, but also endurance sports. So are you saying in terms of like strength training or just in training in general in terms of specificity? I think, I think training in general. Okay. Yeah. So Yes. So it's so important to be specific with what you're training, right? Because it all comes back down to, you know, you either use it or you lose it, you know? Um, So most people tend to have both, you know, fast, fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. That's just a very like general way to describe, you know, that I feel like that's very commonly understood that they're athletes that are more fast twitch they tend to be your sprinters and your power athletes and there are people who have more like slow twitch which would be you know longer endurances they last a lot longer and those are your you know your your endurance athletes your your ultra runners (laughs) hey it's me all the slow twitch fibers (laughs) (laughs) i was the opposite i was fast twitch and i had terrible endurance no matter how much i trained um But so, you know, most people kind of have, they have a, like a mixed smattering of two, you know, you, you have to have some fast twitch and you're going to have to have some slow twitch. It's just how much are you, you know, maybe genetically predisposed to, you know, and then how much are you training in that area too, right? So if somebody who has, you know, a lot of fast twitch muscles, they're naturally a sprinter, but coach didn't know that they weren't aware of that they were just the coach and the athlete just always was training in endurance then they're going to start to develop more slow twitch muscles or those are going to get you know that it's going to get stronger so they can they can work themselves into it they can train themselves to become endurance athletes you know with even though they are maybe predominantly you know or naturally a sprinter, you know, they can train themselves to become an endurance athlete. And the same can be said, likewise, if somebody had a lot of slow twitch, you know, and they're naturally uh, an endurance athlete, you know, they have great stamina, but not a lot of sprint and power in them, then, you know, if they were to train in as a sprinter, they can also become a sprinter too. Um, However, it's finding that sweet spot in terms of like being as competitive as you possibly can. Right. So it's like, oh, I realizing that naturally you're a sprinter. And so you're going to be specific in your training to train as a sprinter. And that's when you see these <coughs> blossom. You know, they kind of found like the sweet spot in like what they're good at, what their bodies are capable of too, you know. Um, and so that also goes into like training in terms of specificity say for example as like a sprinter you know you would want to be more do more plyometrics more power my more hypertrophy and strength programming in terms of strength training um and with with swim programming you want to do shorter higher intensity sets with lots of rest you know and depending on your stroke you know you modify those parameters um for endurance athletes you would want to program so that you're doing more muscular endurance based work you're still doing plyometrics you're doing you're still programming power plyometrics um like some hypertrophy but you're probably going to be more endurance based in terms of your strength programming right because yes we still need all those other things because you know at the beginning of a race, you're kind of sprinting to get going and then you set into a rhythm, into a pace, right? And then you also want to kind of sprint at the end of your race to get to the finish line or, you know, like maybe the like last third of your race, you start to ramp up your pace a little bit so that you, you know, finish quicker, you know, and your middle section might be like a little bit slower. So, you know, in terms of endurance athletes, power and sprint work is still important, but it's just varying how much of the training you're getting and when you're incorporating that type of training cycle into your periodization. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's very fascinating to me, the, uh, 
it's very fascinating to me how many parameters you have to deal with as a coach. Uh, it could be like, it could start with something as simple as like coming back full circle on the conversation, like you talking about like checking their lifestyle, their nutrition, their sleep habits. Um, and also just like, like with any sport, like when a client comes to you, is your goal to like just finish a swim in a triathlon, finish an open water swim or compete at a high level? Like, uh, and so I'm curious, like, as far as like the process you build up over the years, like I'm sure it's like got its challenges and nobody's perfect with it. And we're all figuring things out. Like, mm -hmm. how do you communicate with your clients and what kind of process do you go through to like navigate and adjust all those parameters and factors? Yeah. So right now I primarily coach remotely. So I'm all in app in my coaching. I coach both technique. Um, they, I have an app for technique coaching where they're sending me videos of their swimming and I break down and I analyze their technique with slow motion. I use a lot of kinematic and biomechanical feedback and analysis. Um, and you know, I'll do like freeze frame with voice commentary over it. And I, I break down their stroke frame by frame so that they see what I'm seeing in real time and I'm talking over it. And then I slow everything down and I point out this is exactly what I You know, like let's focus on one thing this work on, say, like your body position. You know, most swimmers have the tendency to look forward when they're swimming, you know, especially open water swimmers, you know, the tendency is to look up and rightly so you want to see where you're going. That's something that's very natural, right? Um, because you, want, you don't want to run into that. But that's probably the one thing you don't want to do is, is look forward because that's going to, that, just you looking forward, there's something called a head hip relationship. And so what goes up, must come down. So if your head is going up, your hips are dropping down. And so now you're swimming at an incline, right? You're swimming uphill. And what's happening is that if you're swimming uphill, you are becoming a wall, all right? And water is hitting you at every point in your body. And you're essentially pressing the gas pedal and pulling on the e-brakes at the same time, you know? So how fast are you gonna go if you're gonna be gassing like flooring it and, you know, dr hanging on that e-brake. It's going to be limited. Also, injuries are going to come <laughs> if you're gassing it and trying to, you know, also do things improperly. Like your car is going to break. <laughs> Something's going to go wrong with your car if you're yanking on that e-brake and gassing it at the same time. So the same analogy applies for the human body, right? So something as little as head position. If you just looked down and fixed that head position, now what goes up, what, what comes down, the other thing must go up. Your head is now coming down. Your hips are going up now. All right, so now you're swimming at a more horizontal plane. So now water is only hitting at this one area, okay? You are in a more streamlined position. Water is just hitting the top of your head, maybe your shoulders, and you're rotating well. And so now water is just flowing underneath you. You have now released the e-brake and you're just pressing the gas pedal so um so i i do a lot of extensive and you know a lot of the times like i can help a lot of my swimmers just immediately swim faster without working any harder if anything they work a lot less hard you know because now they're more efficient in the water they're not they're not pulling on the e-brakes on themselves every time. Um, so I do a lot of that through my app. I also have another app where I do specifically strength rehab um, and swim programming. So a lot of strength training in that app. And there, you know, it's a lot of communication, a lot of back and forth. So, you know, I'm always, I tell my athletes, you know, oftentimes, you know, they they under communicate because they are embarrassed of asking too many questions or they think it's a dumb question, you know, or they don't want to bother me, you know, and it's like, well, my coaching is only going to be as good as you allow me to be. So if you don't tell me that this workout or my 
this new training cycle isn't working for you, like you're not hitting the intervals, you can't do the reps that I request of you, you're not doing the exercises properly, or you're doing it improperly, like you're you're not lifting properly, but you're not sending me form checks, videos for me to offer form checks for, then I'm not gonna know when you're gonna get injured. You know, it's not, this program is not fit for you if you don't communicate with me. So I always, always harp on my clients and, and my athletes, like, hey, you know, I'd rather you over communicate and over share than to under communicate because you're, you and I are doing each other a disservice. You're not training at the level that you can train at, and I'm not coaching you at the level that you can train at. <laughs> so it kind of goes both ways. So, you know, in my app, it's just, I tell my athletes, like, hey, you can text me 24 7. You know, I'll always respond to you. Um, and, you know, just, I would rather you just text me everything and comment on every aspect of the training. That way I can tailor each week until I, until I, you know, know exactly what you need, you know? So usually like my new clients, it's kind of like, you know, we're learning to dance with each other for like the first few weeks, you know? And then we get into a rip and so it becomes a lot easier. I can anticipate what they need and what they're capable of doing. And they also understand like my coaching style as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I, I accommodate, you know, the different, um, the variations between athletes is just, I tell them communicate with me as much as you want. You are able to text me directly. You know, you have 24 seven access to me and I will, I like, I will be there for you as much as you allow me to. <laughs> I, I'm glad you ended on that note of that you will be there as much as they allow you to because um, I do think that that should be emphasized as well. One, I got to a point with ultra running where I realized that I needed to find a coach who had specificity in like the distance I'm trying to do. Yeah. Uh, and it has resulted in like a huge acceleration and improvements. Um, and two, like, it's a very good point that like your coach is not a mind reader you can only <laughs> you can only do as much as you tell them i over text my coach all the time about stuff yep. like every specific detail and i just think that it all comes full circle in this conversation about like a, like no matter the sport you're in but especially everything i've heard about swimming like technique matters intentionality matters mm -hmm. and just communicating matters because your coach, my coach can write me up a training plan and I can go like, oh boy, like this is going to be great, but that doesn't mean I'm going to hit every speed workout or I'm going to succeed at everything. And, or I might have a day where like, uh, I, I, you know, I had stress at work or like, uh, I got, I have a niggle on my foot or something like, what should I do coach? Um, like, but if you don't talk about it, then how's your coach going to know? They're just going to think you're doing all right. So, exactly. uh, yeah, exactly. The worst, the worst thing that can happen is that, you know, you get injured and you're quiet about it, right? And you become disgruntled and angry and upset. And like that all, like your mental health all affects your physical performance as well, you know? So it's just like making sure that you catch something and you program properly before, you know, injuries do happen. And injuries are going to happen from time it's just the nature of being athletic. We're all going to get, you know, run into something at some point. It's a matter of how you handle it and how you can program that into, into your training and your performance. You know, like injuries aren't, it's not a death sentence. It's not career ending for the most part, you know, just depending on your injury. But for most, for the most part, it's not career ending. You can modify your training, you know. Um, and, you know, you'll see a lot of, and that's the thing too, you'll see a lot of, you know, rehab coaches, or if you enter like the healthcare system and go into like the traditional healthcare route of getting like a physical therapist or seeing like an orthopedic surgeon and whatnot, and, you know, with an injury, sometimes they'll tell you like, hey, you need to stop, you know, you can't train right now. Um, and I think that's really hard for a lot of athletes, that's something that like, you know, that might be something that isn't discussed a lot 
and is very detrimental not only physically in terms of their condition but like their mental health. You know, they're used to training like 20 hours of and all these competitive high level athletes that they're paying me to take a break. And if it's like two weeks, it's it's tough, you know, when it's not programmed properly for you to have a rest, you know, to have like rest and whatnot, um, especially in the middle of the season, especially if preparing for like a big race, you know, it's just, it's tough. And so it's finding a way to be able to allow athletes to do their sport while also recovering with an injury, right? It's modifying parameters. It all comes down to being able to modify parameters to so being able to do what you can tolerate in a safe way that also promotes uh, injury recovery with soft tissue healing or, you know, bone tissue as well. So just depending on the injury, you know, there's there are ways around it, but it's, you know, essentially meshing both healthcare and performance into one, right? Finding that sweet spot. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sandra, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. And before we jump on to the rapid fire food section, um, I wanted you to let people know where they can find you um, and where they can get in touch with you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. Um, I am very active there. Uh, you can also find me on my website. Uh, my website is www theswimmersdoc.com um, and my Instagram handle is theswimmersdoc. And so awesome. you can shoot me an email, you can send me a contact form through my website or you can just DM me through Instagram. Um, I will get to it. It's all like I run all of that myself. So I will see your message um, regardless. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So yeah. are you ready for our rapid fire food section? Yes. <laughs> All right, we're gonna have some fun. Uh, French fries or onion rings? Ooh, uh, probably onion rings. Well, <laughs> it's always, I always overthink it when it, when it comes down to food. <laughs> On a day-to-day -day basis, basis, probably French fries. Um, but if I'm, you know, I have not, haven't had it in a while, onion rings, definitely. Any uh, specific kind of French fries? Uh, I like like the string, what are, like the stringy oh, yeah. ones, you know, I, I don't like crinkle cut or like waffle, you know, fries or like the wedges. I'm not into that at all. Like, you know, like the McDonald's ones, like super. Oh stringy. yeah. <laughs> so like traditional almost. Yeah. Traditional fries yeah. almost. Uh, do you have any dipping sauce with your fries? Um, I mean, I'll eat anything, any dipping sauce. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't discriminate when it comes to sauce at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's the right answer. <laughs> uh, popcorn or pretzels? Mm, uh, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of either, but if I had to pick probably popcorn, it's not as dry. And I feel like that you can add different seasons to that. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> pancakes or waffles? Waffles. I don't like pancakes. The <laughs> my husband's a big pancake eater, um, and it's just sometimes it seems a little dry. So waffles just that added like crunch. It's too good to say no. <laughs> That's true. Waffles do have that extra crunch. I can't disagree with that. <laughs> uh, so there's two food trucks: uh, a taco truck and a burger truck. Which one do you pick? Mm, probably a burger truck. Yeah. What kind of, what do you put on your burger? Um, I, I like my burgers medium to medium rare and just anything. I, lettuce, tomatoes. Um, I love banana peppers on them. It's so good. Um, you know, like relish, mustard, ketchup, mayo, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Would you put pineapple on your burger? Yeah, that's... <laughs> I'll try it. I'm always open to trying new things. So yes, I would. <laughs> Man, I'm O for two on that. Every single time there's a little bit of hesitancy, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so peanut butter, are you a fan of peanut butter or any nut butter? I do love peanut butter. Peanut butter is Cr good. Crunchy or creamy? I like both. I, I... <laughs> I think I tend to go with 
creamy just because it's easier to spread. So for me, it's like, okay, how can I make food as quickly as possible? So just <laughs> crunchy, it just takes too long. And sometimes it rips the bread. And so now, you know, I have a hole in my bread and keep it, keep it creamy. <laughs> The specificity carries over everywhere, folks, <laughs> but especially with food. Um, so I got a question for you about sandwiches. Do you do a square cut or an angle cut? Um, a triangular cut or square cut? I don't cut it at all. I just eat it straight on. <laughs> what I like to do is I like to eat the crust around it first, and then I work on the middle. Where like oh. The soft um i've always hated the crust but i was always like forced to eat everything as a kid so now it's ingrained to me to not waste food so i eat mm -hmm. the stuff i hate first and so i tend to eat around and then i have like the best for last so if i cut the bread i'm gonna have to like eat the crust on both ends and then enjoy the middle so i might as well just keep it together and just finish mm. the crust all at once <laughs> Oh, you might be the first person who's mentioned eating the crust and then eating the sandwich. Um, I know, I know there's somebody who mentioned like eating the sandwich, like just like down the middle with like one big bite. <laughs> that was like shocking to me. Actually, yours is a, yours is a bit more tame. <laughs> um, so if you're having PB and J, do you put the PB and J on one slice of the bread? Or do you put PB on one and J on one? I'll put peanut butter on both slices of the bread and then jelly on just one because I like peanut butter more than I like jelly. Oh, okay. First time I think I've heard that too. That's really yeah. smart, actually. <laughs> and so it's like bread, peanut butter, jelly, peanut butter, bread. <laughs> You have to try this too, going back to burgers, but a couple of people have mentioned putting peanut butter on their burgers, in their burgers. Interesting. Yeah. I will try it, that. It sounds very intriguing. Um, are you a cake person or a pie person? Mm, I like pie more, but I, even with the, with the pie, I just like the crust. <laughs> uh, what kind of pie? Mm. I like, um, is it key lime pie? Yeah, I like lemon and like lime desserts. So like anything with like a lemony zest, I like that. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know that I've, I don't know if I've had meringue pie, but I probably would like that too. But I like key lime pie. I'm definitely a crust person myself. Like I love a good crust on a pie. It's just something about it. Yep, mm -hmm. it just tastes so good. <laughs> So good. Uh, and last question. What's your favorite candy? Mm, probably like chocolate candy or like hard candy. Do you have a favorite like chocolate candy or do you like chocolate bars? I like Twix for like a like okay. candy or a chocolate bar. That's probably my favorite. My second would probably be Reese's peanut butter cups. Yeah. Ooh, I love Reese's. <laughs> yeah, those would probably be my favorite too. <laughs> I assume I assume with Reese's you're going traditional and not the uh, new caramel flavor they came up with. No, <laughs> just good, the good. peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's only one right answer for Reese's peanut butter. Cups. Yeah, <laughs> get the king size ones. <laughs> oh, that is that is more absolutely the correct answer. <laughs> Dr. Sandra, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It was such a fun conversation, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. You too. This is such a pleasure. Bye.